In this episode of Mind Pump, we answer questions asked by listeners like you. They go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. Mm -hmm. We post a question underneath the Qua meme, and then we pick the best ones and answer them. But before we do that, we talk about studies, we talk about our lives, uh, what's on our minds. Sometimes it gets real random. It's a lot of fun. That's the introductory portion it's the best when we get of random. this episode. Here's what we talked about in this episode of Mind Pump. So we started by talking about rehab and interventions. Uh, I was talking about this show called Intervention on TV. Really hard to watch. Super depressing. Really powerful. Then we talked about sick kids and how that can be really difficult. Adam's boy is sick right now, and so he got no sleep. Yeah. Um, then we got into a great discussion about the fitness industry. You've all heard us talk about the industry of fitness, but we actually broke it down into different segments and talked about the the value and the detriment of each of the segments mm -hmm. within the fitness industry. Then we talked about quarterly testing of your hormones, the potential value, when it can go too far. I recommend, for example, that men test their testosterone at home by a company called Everly Well about every quarter. This way you can monitor how your workout, diet, sleep, and lifestyle are affecting one of your most important hormones. And these tests are very inexpensive. And again, you can do them at home. Here's what you do if you want to get one of these tests. And by the way, we have a discount for you. Go to everlywell.com, use the code MINDPUMP, and you'll get 25% off of all tests throughout the end of this month. Then we talked about YouTube changing their child advertisement policy. A lot of these very, very popular pages on YouTube uh, stand to lose a lot of money. This is kind of crazy. Yep. Then we talked about uh, skinny dipped almonds. Uh, they actually, by the way, this right now, they released the dark chocolate peppermint skinny dipped almonds. These are phenomenal stocking mm. stuffers. Now, what are they? It's an almond with just the right amount of chocolate so the macros stay good. You're not eating an almond that's just tons of sugar and crap. It's just enough chocolate to give it it's great just flavor. It's on there. And it's a great snack. And we have a discount for you. If you go to skinnydipped.com forward slash mind pump and enter the code mind pump, we will give you a full 20% off your purchase of these amazing almonds. Hurry before I eat them all. Then we talked about the NASA rain machine. This is a bit of a conspiracy theory. Uh, we mentioned artificial neurons. Scientists for the first time have created, artific this is crazy, neurons in the lab. And then we talked about all the controversy around the Peloton commercial. Oh, everybody's freaking out. Oh, man. Then we got into the fitness portion of this episode. This is where we answered the questions. Here's the first question. What are the benefits of very low rep ranges for major lifts, like the bench press, squat, and deadlift? So um, most of you should probably train in these rep ranges, but we talk about the appropriate way to do so and the benefits. The next question, how does sleep affect fat loss, and how does it affect fat loss, even if your macros and calories are correct? The third I'm question- I'm going to sleep all the fat off. <laughs> this person wants to know what our favorite body parts are to train and develop, and how do we go about training them? And the final question of this episode, how do each of us vote with our own dollars? Also, this month- our bodybuilding, body sculpting focused workout program, it's actually one of our most popular programs, MAPS Aesthetic, is 50% off. So when you enroll in this program, what you get is a full workout broken up into phases. The whole program lasts just over three months. Um, and there's exercise demos where we teach you how to do the exercises. We tell you how many reps to do, how many sets. All the guesswork is taken out. This program is designed for those who are aesthetic minded. So if you want to sculpt and shape your body how you see fit. If that's the main motivation for you to work out, this is the best program. Here's how you get the 50% off. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space for the discount. Are we over-caffeinated? I think so. Not enough. Oh, we didn't take our <laughs> Not enough. Count. That's all right. Bro. Dude, you were slipping with the Dude, drugs. Dude, yesterday right, I was... I was Jittery. That's you had the first time, I, that's the first time I've been jittery in a while, dude. I was like, well, okay, 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 okay. Uh, give us a thumbs up. I'm good on my end. Yeah, you, you had too much yesterday, uh, Justin. I did. I, I didn't know it was possible <laughs> this, still. You know what he did? Because well, uh, after we were done podcasting yesterday, Justin looks at me and goes, this is like the first time I ever got like shaky. Yeah. He's, I had to like maintain myself through the podcast. The, what did you do? A bunch of cold brews? Oh, yeah. yeah, I did like three cold brews and then I had like a rock star. <laughs> And then I had that that oh, shitty so I, gel. I forgot we did that rock star yesterday. Yeah, Bro, hold on a right. second. Three cold brew nitro drinks. Yeah. A rock star. Typical. In a row? Yeah, yeah. bang, bang, bang. So yeah. I think, bang. <laughs> who's most likely to be in celebrity rehab one day? 
<laughs> oh, uh, Justin for sure. No, right? no, no. For coffee? Really? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Let's say me. Yeah, yeah. probably. No way, Just bro. don't introduce me to cocaine. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know I, mean? I have my drug habits under control. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? That's so, <laughs> yeah. so far. Keep that, <laughs> keep that bitch at bay. <laughs> yes, keep, keep her at bay. Every, every addict's last words. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yes. I, does anybody ever go to, like, I, I guess so. I guess everybody goes to rehab. It's like self. Like, they're like, oh, I got to go. No, I have, dude, I have a, a, a really cool story with uh, one of my family members who checked themselves in and completely turned their life around. It was really, it was cool to watch because it was a really rough time in our family seeing them. This was years and years ago, uh, but watching him check himself in and then to see what he's done with his life. So, you know, it's cool when you see that because a lot of people, I don't know what the success rate of- uh, It's not good. It's low, right? Yeah. It's, it's not, yeah. it's, the chances are you end up basically doing that your whole life in and out, in and out, in and out. And, uh, you know, he went really, really hard to a point where- you know, was still in his parents' checks and writing himself checks to pay for his drug habits and doing all kinds of stuff. It's crazy how it changes people, yeah. isn't it? Oh, I yeah. wonder if the odds are better if you're the one, it's your idea going into yes. rehab versus, yeah, yes. being, being like, no, like confronted about it. Yeah, the odds are, the, uh, I've looked this up, uh, the odds are much uh, much higher. I, what's crazy to me is, do um, you guys ever watch, uh, what's it called, Intervention? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know. You want to watch something now that you're a father? Just a downward spiral. Watch it. Enjoy. Actually, don't. You won't sleep. Is it no, a movie it's, or is it a show? No, it's it a, a show. It's a series, and oh. what they do is they show people who their family has decided that they need to do an intervention. Mm. But the shitty part about it, and it fucked me up as a as a parent, is they show first they'll show the person in full addiction mode. You know, mm -hmm. doing math, living. You know, you know, pulling Still tricks, living at, with mom. Yeah, yeah, doing. You know, selling their bodies or just terrible stuff. And you're watching this like, wow, that sucks. But then it gets really fucked up when they interview the family members and the family members talk about them when they were kids and they show pictures of when they were kids and oh, yeah. you know, how good a kid they were yeah. and everything. And, and then there was some started, kind of trauma, yeah. like, yeah, and then we got divorced and their father left a lot and then he got into drugs at Usually, that point. Usually, yeah, it was a tra traumatic experience oh, that was the catalyst. So hard. Yeah. And then you watch the intervention and the parents and the family members and the friends who are saying, because what they, what they advise them to do is to say, here's the ways that you've hurt me. And then you also have to tell them what you're going to take away, but you have to mean it. Like, if you don't stop doing this, you'll never see my kids again or something like that. And these family members are crying. Dude, it's brutal. Oh, yeah. it gives me the chills, dude. Damn, what did it? Courtney, yeah. I was like, dude, I I don't know. It's too heavy for me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like, know. I just want to, like, watch, you know, Beavis and Butthead or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's a little bit lighter. <laughs> like, let's chill out yeah. here. I want to laugh a little Adam bit. Wilson, and... You, you want to watch 16 and Pregnant? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Turn off this depressing <laughs> show. <laughs> this yeah. show. That's my sick show, and I don't feel good. Yeah, I haven't right. been sick in a long time, knock on wood, Whoa, actually. Max yeah. is sick right now. So oh, that's... He's, what he's got? Uh, I don't know. He's got something. It sounds like it. It's uh, sounds like it's in his throat a little bit because it's. Uh, it, it sounds like he's congested, but he's not. His his uh, his uh, nasal pathway is fine. Like we can't or we he's there. So it's like in his throat, and you can hear it. Like the post nasal drip, maybe. Yeah, right? yeah. And he, he was up all. We were up all night last night um, with him, and you know Katrina's with him right now. I don't know what she's doing because I know she was supposed to go into work today, so I don't know what she's doing. Now is that hard for you to <laughs> to to when your kid is sick? That you start to I don't know when when I happen when I would see my kids sick it's really difficult to deal with. Yeah, well I I mean I was telling her so she's I'm more I'm harder, I'm more you know, let him cry, sure. you know, I'm I'm that one. She's you know, she's the mom. She's definitely the, you know, coddle the nurturer. Yeah, yeah, the nurturer, right? So I think we fall into the uh, the roles or whatever. Uh, she, I she is normally the one quick to do that stuff. Well, when he's sick like this, like I was the one who was like, hey, you know, I know we're really stringent on his bath time in bed, do all the stuff of like that, but he's not feeling well. You and I are sitting by the fire. Like, let's hold him. Let's just hold him. And, oh, and keep, man. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's because, and that's just it. As I, as much as I'm, I'm hard on all those things, like, it's because I know it's important that we uh, establish structure for him. So I don't want uh, my, you know, two year old or four year old you know, screaming at nine o'clock at night, wanting to play still and do stuff like we're training him now. Yeah. We're sleep training him. And he's, he's actually uh, really good. Like you bath him and then you, go, you get, give him his uh, last feeding and then he's out by mm. seven thirty for us and sleeps all night. But you know, there's exceptions to that rule. Like he's, he feels terrible right now and I can hear him when he's crying the way he's crying. It's, it's hard. Different. For, yeah. It's different. Uh. You know, so, 
you know, the, uh, when stuff like that, and that's where I feel like that's where you are flexible. If he's crying just to be crying and get, get, get me out of bed, like, that's where I'm more like, no, let him cry. Yeah, you right. know, he's got to learn. This is bad time. Yeah. Like, so, but, you know, the kid's sick. Like, yeah. you know, then I, I, I'm definitely yeah. got that nurturing um, <laughs> characteristic. And it's funny because my kids, they, you know, obviously they, they're half the time at my house, the other half the time at, my, at their mom's house. It, but when they're sick, even if they're at their mom's house, they call me. Yeah. And they want me to come over. Yeah. So like my daughter, uh, she was sick. Uh, I mean, it was like a few weeks ago, and she called me up and she's like, "Papa," and I can hear in her voice, like, "Oh, how are you feeling, honey? Can you come over?" I'm like, "Sure, absolutely, I'll come over." And so I'll come over. I'll bring elderberry, and you know, <laughs> I'll put the blanket on her and I'll lay with her and whatever. So it's 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 interesting to see how my kids they want they reach out to me for that because that's you know what I do. I yeah, guess. it usually takes like so. I I I vividly remember my my oldest his. Like the 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 first time he got like really sick, it was like uh, you know stomach flu or whatever. And we were uh, in Tahoe at the time uh, with with some other ones of my friends and like these other kids and um, like and he it was his birthday and so we're all celebrating his birthday. He eats a cake and all this and then he just like turns like pale white and he's like puking and stuff. And then I was like, oh man, I guess that didn't you know settle right or whatever. But then the whole night he was just like you could tell like mm -hmm. it was like a bug you know that he had and so i was like that was the first time he'd even been like puking or anything and it was like pandemonium and my friend was laughing at me because he's like oh it's the first time he got like really sick <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, I'm like yeah dude like what do i do you know and i'm like sleeping in you know on the floor next to him the whole night and, like we didn't get any sleep but it's like you know, it's one of those things that kind of throws you, you know, your feet out from under you. Dude, is there anything worse? You haven't experienced this, Adam, but you will. Everybody does. But is there anything worse than when your kid wakes you up in the middle of the night because they puked all over the place? Oh, yeah. That has to be the well, worst. actually, there's one that it usually involves shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. dude, it sucks. So make things out of it. They're throwing it. Oh, yeah. You'll hear it. You'll see them, like, they'll, they'll knock on the door or you'll hear them, uh, and then you'll know, like, oh fuck, yeah. And you'll go, and it's like two o'clock in the morning, puke on the floor, on the bed. So you have to clean the kid; they're crying. Yeah, you got to clean their fucking bed spread. You got to clean the floor. Mm -hmm. It's a freaking hour and uh, a half now that's ordeal. Not, the worst story I hear, and and I've had friends tell me, oh, this is coming, so get ready. And I'm like, I fucking hope Max doesn't do this. <laughs> I'm gonna hang him by his toes if he does. But they, they're like, oh, there'll come a time when he is walking around and stuff and he shits his diaper and he just sticks his hand down yeah, his, his grabs pants it. and starts grabbing his shit and throwing it and stuff. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, yeah. what? Yeah. They, they do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. I don't remember that, raising my brother and sister. I don't remember they do that. Just, so I'm hoping that's they're, just- They're curious, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, like, huh, what? I sure as shit hope Weird. that's not my son, dude. I'm like, <laughs> and they just smear it on the wall. <laughs> that, that happened with you? No. I okay, yeah. good. So there's yeah. hope. No, there's no. hope. But no. Justin no. saying that- Boys, dude, you know the odds, but uh, maybe the one boy thing. I don't know. You might get lucky, but it's, it's those leftover chimp instincts. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Ah, oh, look, throw it. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I've shared before that you know I, I played obviously a, a big role in, in my my two youngest <clears throat> my two youngest brother and sister. Uh, with raising them, so I spent a lot of time uh, in their early years and changing diapers, and and I don't ever remember. Uh, anything like that. So, mm. but I've had friends who are like, "Oh yeah, you just wait till he does that, man. You're gonna love that." I'm like, "What?" Yeah, he just did. I think because we left him too long downstairs in his crib, and you know he was like sitting in it, and he just like reached down there and just started smearing it everywhere. The whole like, oh my god, it was it was like a murder scene of of shit. Like, it was just <laughs> everywhere. He because he at that point he he learned how to climb out too. So he we we had this problem of him like when we'd leave him there for too long he'd just like climb out and like walk around and, like grab things and that's another thing where he like ended up like putting a marble in his mouth swallowing I took him to the ER for that too it was like <laughs> it was my youngest that's like man like I I'm probably gonna like be white like my my hair's gonna be white you know because of him <laughs> yeah that's so funny yeah <laughs> anyway dude so this morning I was you know doing my you know social media or whatever and. Um, you know, there's this trend that uh, I feel like we're, we've we were kind of a part of that now I think has kind of become uh, a little bit out of control. What's um, that? You know, when we first started the podcast, we would talk a lot about the fitness industry, right? We'd refer to fitness industrial complex. The, yeah, the the industry of fitness, and we would talk about the negatives and some of the stuff that it does, and you know what to look out for and that kind of stuff. 
And, you know, in, 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 this is a very powerful technique in politics. In, in politics, it's a very powerful technique to create a clear enemy, put yourself on the other side, because it's easy to understand for people to hear. It also tends to strengthen your position. And I see now people in our space taking advantage of that power and using it kind of the wrong way. And so I'm referring to, like, I see these fitness you know, model influencers who, you know, as usual, they just don't, they don't provide great information at all. Most of the information they provide is terrible. Now they're referring to the evil fitness industry and I'm against it. And they're using this tactic in a way that I think is very negative. And the truth is when you examine the, the fitness industry, I mean, that covers just a huge umbrella, but I think if we break it up into uh, segments, I think it's a little bit more accurate. And I want to do this so that people, when they're hearing some of these arguments that are very powerful, that can be very, very powerful, uh, that they're privy and they know like, oh, wait a minute, you know, who am I listening to? And they're cre- they're using this this tool that's been used in politics uh, for so long. Oh, I, you feel that way. I also think that uh, another thing that, you know, we were talking about early on was the authentic thing, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, and that, that's been completely uh, ab- abused now. <laughs> it's the opposite is, is what's happening is, you know, people that, uh, you know, think that being authentic is something that you you practice or you try to do. Yeah. Uh, are are presenting it on mm-hmm. Instagram? You have to show your authenticity. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. By taking a shit. Yeah, yeah. 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 So <laughs> brushing your teeth with messy hair. I and, feel like yeah. in the last five years we have, and I, I don't. I'm, I'm interesting where you're going to take this conversation because I don't know where I stand on this, right? Because there's there's a part of me that goes, hey, you know, I uh, I'm proud that we. We, we put that out there, you know, years ago, and uh, I feel like, I mean, I just made this statement on the forum. I was thanking the forum for uh, them being with us for as long as they have and that they're a big part of uh, of the success that Mind Pump's had. And, and I really feel like for the first time uh, that we have a, a real voice in the space. Like, mm-hmm. I feel uh, we were building towards that and, right. you know, we acted as if we did way back when, you know, we had just a few thousand people listening. But... I do feel like now we have a real voice in it, and I have to. I have to think that a lot of what you're talking or alluding to, it's probably coming because it's 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 spread from yeah, what has, we've been it saying. It looks like a formula. And, I, and what I what I why what I'm saying is that where I don't know where you're going with this, but I don't know where I stand yet on it because I want to believe that because of that message, it's done more good. Uh, than harm, but I don't know. Where are you, where I, are you taking this? I think it has uh, done more good. But like any powerful tool, it can be wielded um, in a lot of different directions, and it can be used to manipulate people or to sell a crappy product or to do all the bad stuff that we talk about um, you know, on the show uh, you know, all the time. And here's the thing about ideas, because that's an idea, right? To talk about like, here's what the industry does, here's what you need to pay attention to. Ideas are very powerful, and they spread. Um, and when they're powerful and they're effective, they spread very, very quickly. So the idea of demonizing or talking about or collectivizing the fitness industry, um, you know, it started and it's exploded. And again, I see a lot of people using it negatively. So I'm going to break it down into subcategories so people have an easier time discerning, you know, you know, good from bad besides the the message itself. So I went in and I thought about my, I thought about this for myself. I thought, okay, the fitness industry has done some very good things. Obviously, it's brought us exercise, it's brought us nutrition, it's brought us good behaviors, it's brought us motivation. Um, but a lot of that has come from, if we really think about it, it's come from one segment, which is the fitness trainer industry, the, the, the segment of the fitness industry that is made up of trainers, coaches, and people whose ultimate passion and job is to help other people. Like, you know, if you're, when you're a personal trainer, for example, it's of course not true for all trainers, but if you've been a personal trainer, especially for a long time, the reason why you did that is probably because your main passion is helping people and your secondary passion is fitness. You love both of those things because if you didn't, you wouldn't last longer than three years. I, I can't imagine somebody lasting as a personal trainer longer than three years who didn't have a deep passion for those things because it's a hard job to make a lot of money. Yep. You're taking on a lot of people's stress. It is not your typical nine to five job. It's a difficult job to do. But if you're passionate about it, you find meaning in it, then it's extremely worthwhile. So that's where I think a lot of the the good is coming from. But there's different segments that I think the majority of the bad shit that we get is coming from. So one of them being the fitness modeling industry. Mm. Now, these are people who look hot. They're sexy. They look phenomenal. They're muscular. They're 
you know, they have nice asses and nice arms and great legs and whatever. And they're part of the fitness modeling industry. But because they have so many eyes on them, they pivot and turn that into if they can't money, if they can't make money directly off of modeling, which is very difficult, um, then they'll try to make money. Uh, they'll pivot off that and then turn that into, hey, everybody looking at me because I look good. Mm. Here's some good advice. They're not trainers. Oh, by the way, I have skinny teeth. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. They're not trainers. They did not enter to the- And they're not always promoting bad shit either, I think. I think they're just not experienced. Uh, we we have friends that are like this that have, yeah. uh, you know, they've made a name for themselves because they've been, ma- they did an incredible job of getting themselves in really good shape. They, they have the look. Uh, they've competed, they've been on covers of magazines, sure. and so they've drawn a lot of attention and eyes. And the natural progression of that, especially right now in a trend where online coaching is exploding, it's the natural pivot. Now, the unfortunate part, well, this is also what I, we saw this. We saw- Oh, this was the worst. We saw the opportunity to come into this space because- the majority of the money that was being made was being made by these people. That's right. They were they were the one, and it was very easy, I think, for each of us. And this was even before we got together. We were already observing this. It was very easy for us to go like, oh, wow, like a lot of this information that they're presenting is – uh, it's not up to par with like what you would want to be coaching or talking to a client. And I don't think it, it comes from – uh, a bad place, I think it's just more naive. It you comes just- from the wrong place because think about the past. I just talked about the fitness trainer industry and their motivations. Their passions are help people and then their passion is fitness. The fitness modeling industry, what is their passion? Their passion is body obsession yeah, and, and looking perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's their passion. So the information that they provide is through that lens. So they're going to give the information that is going to encourage body image issues, encourage body obsession, um, it's going to prey on insecurities. However, indirectly, it's just the lens that it's coming through. And a lot of the shitty information that we get in the fitness industry is coming from the fitness modeling ang- ag- uh, industry. There's another uh, segment of the fitness industry that also provides terrible information. And this is the fitness entertainment industry. These are the ones that make the fitness programs that are really designed to razzle and dazzle you right. and entertain the shit out of you. Right. So these are your, you know, your boot camp and your fucking, you know, your your, your Western hip hop dance, you know, <laughs> workout videos and your, right. you know, whatever you want to call them. And when you watch them, they're exciting, they're motivating, they're fun to watch, terrible workouts, terrible right. programming. Their passion is not to help people and their passion is not fitness. Their passion is to entertain and yeah. to sell Lots of programs. They are driven by those two things. And so the information that they provide is also terrible. This is what all the stuff that we battled as trainers when clients would come in, be like, but mm-hmm. I thought I was supposed to do five, 10 exercises back yeah. to back. And I thought I was supposed to, you know, do yeah. tons of cardio. This isn't as fun, you know, like you get that a lot of times too, because you get those classes that are just like, there's lights, there's music, there's energy, there's all this stuff. And um, it's- remember the flood of uh, Biggest Loser people that came in totally. when that show launched. Uh, totally. I mean, I remember uh, just- Fitness getting- entertainment industry yes, right there. Yes, right. I mean, that and the, and the having to, that was such a challenge as a trainer, getting those clients. It was great. It was driving clients to the gym. But then the challenge as a trainer was they wanted that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I want to be yelled at and made me run like crazy. And like it's like no, like you don't understand. Yeah. Like this treat is, me like a piece of shit. This is yeah. not sustainable. There's a <laughs> there's a reason why wanna... eighty plus percent of those people put all that weight on. It's it's not realistic. No, and every good trainer knows that. Every good trainer knows to not uh, rest upon or focus on or make this the pillar of your training. Where I'm trying to entertain the shit and motivate the shit out of my clients. Does it's impossible for that to last forever? It just doesn't work. We are not. We, we didn't evolve to always be motivated. Being motivated is a feeling, just mm-hmm. like being happy, sad, or whatever. You can't possibly Comes and goes. So if you're if you're if that's what you're resting on, and that's what you're focused on is on motivation, excitement, energy. What you'll end up creating is first off, there's no there's no real good exercise programming. So the workouts are not good. They're not meant to be good. They're meant to be fun and exciting. And you're going to create a situation where people work out and then stop working out mm-hmm. and then work out and then stop, which is exactly what we see a lot of. And then there's a third uh, piece of the fitness industry that I also see causing a problem. Now, this one has more value, but I also see this causing a lot of problems. And this is the fitness academia industry. Now, this industry, these, these are these are the researchers, these are the PhDs, these are the people that study exercise, study nutrition. 
Their passion is to learn the science of fitness and nutrition, and their value really is to present to trainers. Their value is not to present. Not to your everyday Not at all. Mm -mm. In fact, as most personal trainers start the way that they train people in this space, when you first become a trainer, this is how you communicate information to clients. It's through science. And you think, I used to do this all, this is, geez, this is the first five years of training. Client would come to me, they'd want to lose 30 pounds or whatever, and I'd give them all the information. You break the Krebs cycle down to them. Oh, yeah. I'd give them all, all, <laughs> yeah. They're just looking at you like, oh, yeah. my God. I'd give them all the yeah. facts and everything. Uh, yeah. and, uh, I've been doing it so wrong. Te terrible, right? I mean, yeah. how effective was that? No, that's exactly what yeah, I used to do that. I used to break the Krebs cycle down. That was like, the <laughs> that was literally like, that was part of my presentation. Nice. Yeah, so. yeah. Exactly. And so it's, it's not good. It's not a great, uh, that part of the industry is not awesome to take information and communicate it to the average person because they're the ones that tell people it's all about calories, it's all about macros. I mean, there's and here's the thing. This is why that part of the industry is so uh, difficult is because what they're saying is not false. Right. Now, the fitness modeling and fitness entertainment industry- They're wrong. Pure bullshit. <laughs> yeah. Fitness right. academia industry, they are presenting correct information. It's just not- the context matters. You're not communicating that the right way. No, so it's, it's just not so it's so nuanced that the average consumer gets lost in the weeds. Totally, and because there's so many studies too that contradict each other, it just becomes super c confusing. And then a lot of them are they end up being in camps and they drive stakes and this is what the science says. No, this is what the science says. And then we're 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 debating over things that yeah. honestly, and when it took me at least a decade of training clients to realize, well, wait a second. All the all the science that I've learned over this last decade definitely has helped me become a better trainer and understanding, you know, human physiology, kinesiology. But at the end of the day, what really fucking matters is the psychological piece sure. and the behavioral piece. Yeah. And that's something that you just don't hear a lot of people communicating when in reality Well, because they want to be right. Yeah. You know, and that that's the basis of of you know that's where it. they're coming from. They 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 have to be right, like the facts, the facts, the right. facts. But you know, what's the unintended consequence of that for the person on the outside looking in, you know, that's just trying to, you know, understand like where to start. Like that's how do I get going? A hundred percent because a, a good trainer who's been training for a long time, whose passion is helping people and and also fitness, eventually reaches this conclusion. It and takes time because you learn it through client after client after client, eventually you reach this conclusion right here. My goal is not to be right or to give this person tons of information. My goal is to help this person achieve permanent success, mm -hmm. to achieve a good relationship with exercise and nutrition within the frame of their life, their ind how individual they are, and to give them permanent success. And this is why the trainer, the fitness trainer, or dare I say guide, part of the fitness industry. The reason why that's the good part is because they take all that stuff. They call all the segments of the fitness industry and they, they add like a filter, you know, it all pours into them and what comes out purified water. They're giving you exactly what you need. They're guiding you and they're coaching you to take you to the right place. So, you know, I, and I wanted to make that, that discernment because again, I'm seeing a lot of the fitness modeling industry. I'm seeing the fitness academia industry, mm. the fitness entertainment industry, yeah. all acting like they're opposing the evil fitness industry. When in reality, <laughs> you're yeah. a part of exactly what we're talking about. Yeah. So I feel like if I break it down a little more, it'll make it harder for them. Is to this get away what with you're going to talk about on Friday? No, you should maybe. I absolutely think yeah. you should. That's a, such a great place to have this discussion. We're going to be talking to other future leaders and business and entrepreneurs in this space. I think mm -hmm. that's a, and I'm going a different direction. I know my yeah. talk is more related to our business and scaling a company and what that looks like. Sure. So I think that would complement. Well, it. Well, I think it's tough because you do see traction being really divisive, you know, and being able to like lead people into just one train of thought. Like that's why these camps exist. That's why they're so deeply rooted uh, because it, it, it benefits them financially in, in ways that they don't really see outside of that. The bigger picture of it where they could help a lot more people by, you know, adopting and incorporating all these modalities. Yeah. And that's why when we, you know, we, I love talking to trainers and coaches uh, so much because they're the, they're the, they're the good soldiers in the fight against poor health and chronic disease and helping people in real, you know, ways and long-term ways. And, and I know how hard that is. I know how long it takes. I know it's the long game. This is not, you cannot help change someone in a, 
you know, 15 minute motivational speech or a great article or all this information. <clears throat> it takes time. You know, when I would train a client, it would take years for them to really get to the place where I, you know, where I could look at them and say, you know what, this person has been mm -hmm. changed it positively permanently. I feel confident that this person now has created the behaviors, has created a relationship with themselves, exercise and nutrition to where, you know, they don't, they don't need me well, anymore. They, they have a need... deep understanding that yeah. was uh, planted there. Do you, do you think if you're like a, a, a consumer or a listener right now and, and you're trying to um, discern whether this is the person I'm listening to is giving good, do you think there's like signs or red flags that you, you notice or common things? Like, for example, uh, I think that like one of the things that you see when you, when you separated all these segments and, and the, the place that they're coming from, they all seem to, or a majority of them, I should say, um, seem to default to the motivational angle totally. because oh, yeah. I think that's such a, it's a, it's an easy, it's a it's low like hanging, a big red button. Well, it's a low hanging, Motivation. it's a low hanging fruit because it feels good. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, even I, myself, I, there's still pages that I follow on Instagram because it feels good to watch the hype, the hype, the hype gives me a rush and makes me get excited to go to the workout. And because I, I, I get a, 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 physio a physiological response from it, it keeps people coming back. And so I wonder if the average person can discern from that and go like, oh, am I really getting that good? Or is this person just feeding my that feeding that rush that I, I like and I want, and that's why I think I really like them because when I look at their page, they feel motivational, inspiring, and I like it. Is it, you, you think that? I think that's a big that's a big one. I think the another big one is when you're listening to the advice of a fitness person, or you're asking them a question. If it doesn't uh, if it doesn't take strongly take into account individual variants uh, and context then you know you're dealing with someone who has very little experience. Well, a good example. Mm -hmm. When we had that great interview just recently with Brett Contreras, you know, mm -hmm. a good example of a, oh, he's real, a, he's been training people a, for a long really time. good fucking trainer. Yeah, you can it's, tell. Even, we took him in all different directions, and, you know, no matter what we were challenging or asking, it's always, well, depends. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then th it, in this scenario, this, and in this scenario, that. Like, you can always, to me, I can always tell, okay, this guy is definitely trained. Not only does he understand the science, but he's also trained a lot of people mm -hmm. to answer questions like that. Totally, totally. So anyway, I wanted to bring that up because I was <laughs> yeah. up this morning. I think you should, I think that's a great Friday talk. I don't know if you've decided what you're going to speak yeah, on Friday. Yeah, I have, Friday. Some, I have yeah. some stuff I, I think I, I really think that would be a, a great direction. I could definitely throw it in if, uh, if, if I go a little short or whatever. Mm. Um, but anyway, another thing I wanted to bring up is I got, um, you know, since we've been working with, you know, these a third, one of the, what we b believe to be one of the better third third-party hormone testing companies, Everlywell. Mm. I get lots of questions now where people ask me, what tests should I do or how often should I test myself? Yeah. And, you know, I think here's the thing. First off, over testing yourself, probably not a good idea if it causes you a lot of stress mm -hmm. and anxiety. That being said, if you're healthy and okay, because there are people who become, you know, like hypochondriacs yes, about it. Yeah. And I totally can identify. <laughs> yeah. I know exactly what that feels <laughs> like. I know it could turn into the scale yeah. for somebody, right? Yes. It could turn into becoming a slave to it and freaking out over every single thing. Totally. I, I look at it kind of like, um, you know, body fat testing. Uh, you, you need to give it a little bit of time. You don't want to be testing so regularly that it's like one week in you, and then you're you're noticing up or down, and you're freaking out, and you're redirecting mm -hmm. your your plans or, or your your programming or your nutrition, like. You know, I think you need to give yourself a, at least a month to yeah. a few months. Enough time to adapt to whatever and, like, you're And to have some consistency of yeah. whatever it is. Yes. So you you implement something. You say, okay, I'm going to follow whatever said diet. I'm following this program now or I'm addressing my sleep now. Or you decide that – and this is how I use it is, you know, I, I it's – basically quarterly for me. I'm probably once every three to four months. I would agree. Uh, I test and me more so than anything. I, I use all, I use a lot of them, but the hormone one is the one I'm most consistent with uh, because obviously what I've discussed with my hormone levels and I do, I, I, you know, I, I implement one or two things and that's it is the change. I, I add, okay, I'm going to do the red light therapy three times a week for at least 10, 20 minutes. And that's, I'm committed to that. See what that does. Right. I'm going to increase my carbohydrates. These are the two things I'm going to be doing. I'm going to stick to that. Everything else pretty much the same and yep. then test. I yeah. agree. Cause I think uh, number one, if you have symptoms, that's a good idea uh, when, when you want to test. Um, the thing I like about the at home test is that, you know, there, there's a bit of a, a barrier when you go to the doctor. If you were going to go to the doctor and say, hey, I'd like to test my hormones, you know, every quarter, they're, 
they're going to probably say no. At it. Yeah. It's expensive. It's difficult. Um, so, you know, what I recommend to people, like if, for men, um, I think a quarterly testosterone test is probably great. Um, and then depending on what those tests say, then you would go to see your doctor. So if you see these tests come back every quarter and you see this big discrepancy, um, go to, then go to the doctor and say, hey, I took this at-home test. What do you think? What's the deal? And then take it from there. Uh, but really the value of those tests, uh, you know, you don't want to turn into a, a where you freak out and become a hypochondriac. The value of them is really is just to really confirm potential symptoms that you may have or see what your training and diet are doing. And then, of course, make sure you go to a it's, doctor. It's the same way. I, I mean, I love these things. And I know there's people out there that love to shit on stuff like this. And, and, and again, you're talking about the science people, right? They try and pick apart. Oh, this could be by 2%. This could be off. Or, right, right, right. You know, the Fitbit tool. Oh, that's yeah. been shown to be 15% inaccurate on this. And it's like, you know what's crazy? If you've been doing this for as long as I have, like, I didn't have any of those fucking tools. And no. I was trying to help people. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I was trying to help people with their hormones. I was trying to help people with their vitamin D deficiencies. Yeah. I was trying to help people with their fucking, with their steps. We and had under, terrible their, handwritten like, yeah, their, formulas. Yeah, their calories <laughs> burn. And the, you, know? You, know what, you know what I had back then? Super is, inaccurate. Uh, tell me how you're feeling. Or, you know, the scale. Like, that's all I had. Like, so the fact that we have all these resources. Remember the nutrition book that we used to use to, to yes. give people macros? Yeah, yes. dude. You have to carry this around with you yeah, everywhere. Calorie king.com and oh, use the, yeah no you had I, to actually measure all the food and everything yeah. that, to, gets, so oh, for me I, and i guess um absolutely i can find the holes and the, the place nothing is 100 percent accurate right there's nothing out there yeah. that's, there's such an individual variance there but man if you can give me a tool yeah. that gives me some insight of some specific insight on something that i'm monitoring it's well, convenient. is consistent Right, like, like if you can see trends based off of like yes. you know the consistency of it, I mean, there's su there's a ton of value. In yes, that. totally, a hundred percent. Oh, by the way, did you guys see? Uh, I wanted to bring this up. Did you guys see YouTube's policy, their child advertising or whatever policy change? <laughs> oh, oh, have they changed that because of the the ways around it? All these pedophile people. No, no I heard, I heard, talking I heard the they were comments. using that. You they were using the data to market, right? Yes, That's, dude. yeah. So I, what, oh, I didn't read all of it. What, okay. what? So there was a law that says that you cannot capture uh, anybody under the age of 13's information or data from the internet. Uh -huh. You're not allowed to capture it and then use it to market uh, to kids. So mm -hmm. there's a law. Mm -hmm. And the U.S. government now used that law, which is an old law, it's been around for a while, to uh, against uh, YouTube and Google, and they just fined them $170 million with, a, with a, a warning, you need to stop doing this. Now, why is this a big deal? There are channels on YouTube, some of the highest yes. money-making channels on YouTube. Just channels. focused on kids. Yeah. The little kids, yes. like opening up presents or playing with toys. So what they can't do now is they can't, there's two types of commercials you can do on YouTube. You can do context-based commercials. So like, because you're on my channel, the commercials will match the channel. So like, you know, we have a fitness channel, so fitness commercials will pop up. Then there's the way more powerful behavioral based uh, commercials where they know the things that you watch and what you do based off your data. And then they target you specifically with a commercial, which is what makes internet marketing so powerful. So what they've basically done is said, you can't use the most powerful thing about the internet anymore against anybody in the age of 13. So all these channels are losing tons of money. Interesting. Isn't that yeah. crazy? Now, where do you guys stand on all that? I Because it's kids... I have, uh, I have, you know, one thought. Like, I don't. I, I think the people that freak out about everybody using. Our, I mean, at the end of the day, all this surveillance data. It's to make companies more money. That's why they want it. They don't want it to spy on your fucking family and watch sure. you naked in your living room. They don't give a shit about your, mm. you know, buying habits because they want to sell you out to somebody or the government. Like, they want it so they could sell you products totally. better. And for that, I don't care. Like, it's if they mm. if they're if for it. For the majority, most people will appreciate, you know, being advertised things that I'm more interested in than things that I'm not interested. I get yeah. annoyed by getting hit with advertisement on something that I have no desire. But if it's if I'm constantly being fed things that I'm interested in, yeah. I like that as a consumer. I'm but, with you 100 percent with that. But they also have proven that the government's used that data too. So yeah, yeah. you know, it's That's like true. if you want to be real like tin foil about it, like, and you're that kind of paranoid person, you know, then you would you would be valid in your concerns. But like for me, it's again, it's 
it, it's making the consumer experience, you know, more specific. So I, I, I get things that I want to actually see and, you know, and I appreciate the, you know, the way that they can like not just put just random shit in front of me that I don't even care about. Yeah, I can, I can actually straddle this, uh, this, this issue and play both sides. And, and I can, sometimes I feel one more than the other. Like for example, are, is advertising, um, influential? Does it have power? to influence behaviors, feelings, and stuff like that. Well, yeah, obviously. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a trillion-dollar industry. So they're doing this to little kids. Um, is that different than when they would do it to adults? I can definitely make an argument for that. Now, here's where I go on the other side. Is government regulating that really going to help? You know, We're going to give the worst people the keys to regulating that because what it sounds to me like is they're trying to keep <clears> – <throat> mainstream media more competitive by fucking with news new media yeah you know what i'm saying because it's basically tv commercials now well i was just gonna say right? not, not only that how is it any different than when i was you know seven years old watching you know fucking ducktales and the commercial <laughs> and the commercials that came up were gi joes and were the boy toys things that i would what how was that any oh, different? they made cereal just like they, they make cartoons like specifically to sell cereal right yeah. so i mean it's is, different because how that's a contextual commercial meaning they're gonna put a commercial based off of the content that's on the channel okay behavioral advertising is they have all your data they right. follow so you they, around i mean they would have done that back in tv days if they could have of course yeah right it's just yeah. we just we it's have super valuable we yeah. have the ability now with with computers to to capture this data and then refine the way that they market and advertise i don't know how much i'm anti that well here's the irony of it and, and i've seen i've read articles on this they could follow parents around get their information, which is perfectly legal, and with incredible, scary accuracy, predict yeah. the kids. Well, of course. You know, In right. fact, I read an article that so showed that- school, from school, Starbucks, this, that. Yes, yeah. I read an article that showed that if you were never on the internet, let's say you have never been online, you've never done anything, but they were, but they follow three mm. people that are oh, social. They can with you. triangulate exactly. What they you predict are. everything about you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so even that's, if you're not on, that's pretty cool. Actually, you're fine. Yeah, <laughs> you're I fine. still have a couple friends like that. They're not on any social media. They think that they're like you know, yeah, I'm totally off the grid, dude. Like, yeah. no, 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 you're not. You're if still you're, texting. You're, you're, you're texting in the US, me. They know yeah. you're connected to me. Yeah. You're fucked. I'm right next to you. So what, what, you're I, fucked. what I always think that's is weird is when you. This happened to me the other day, actually. Um, I mentioned Skinny Dipped. The, one of the sponsors that we work with. Yeah. How does this happen? Does it ever happen? You, to you get ads popping up. All yeah, right? dude. Yeah. All of a sudden on Facebook. Yeah. And the ad pops because up because they hack the microphone. Like they they they, they, they cool. key in on, on on words. Like and I think like Amazon actually got in trouble for that with Alexa because it was doing that. And that's, it was just like that's fucked up. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. crazy. I it's funny. I actually got turned on to a new like kind of conspiracy. I don't know how new it is. It's probably old in, in the conspiracy world, but it had one that was like actually based in some reality. So like just with the, the Jeffrey Epstein one, like we brought up was interesting. This one was like the cloud seeding, and then also NASA has like this machine that that actually can produce these huge clouds and then they, then can can make these rain clouds basically it it was a trip i showed you guys it's like this tower where they're quote unquote testing uh you know these these engines for you know their their shuttles their space shuttles but the amount of you know condensation and stuff that's coming out of it like billows out it creates huge fucking clouds and so in the rain yeah they're thinking that they're able to manipulate the weather with pretty like act like accurate you know this this reminds me of the you know sal just did a really good uh interview with the word on fire guys and i was listening to it yesterday and you, you made a statement which i've heard you talk about before and i, I agree 100 percent with is we are in a time now, it's getting crazy, right? I mean, we were talking uh, just a month ago, I brought up the glowing mice and, you know, <laughs> science has come yeah, so right. far. They've that, grown bo they've grown ears on mice. Have you seen that? Yeah. They'll yeah, grow yeah, a fucking yeah. human ear on a yeah, mouse, dude. Right. What so, are you doing? <laughs> you know, so, you know, and Whoa. one, of, and one yeah. of the things that science doesn't do, science always says, can we, right? They don't ever say, should we? Of course. Yeah. And, you know, here's a situation where, you know, we're, we think we know everything about the fucking, you know, environment that we're going to now manipulate our weather and not... You know, we, we still, every decade we go back and forth, right? Uh, it's every decade or two decades, I'd say, you know, we're global warming, we're global cooling, we're global, we go back and forth arguing and there's two. There's Actually, you bring up a very good point. Um, they, the, the consensus is that what we're doing is impacting the climate. Now, here's where the science uh, is not conclusive. 
is because they've predicted this several times. They predicted uh, that you know these parts of the of the world will be covered in water. Uh, they haven't been. They predicted we're going to be in an ice age. Uh, that was in the seventies. That hasn't happened. Um, there, there's a lot of science that we don't know yet, but we come to very arrogant. But you do make a good point about the morality of science. Science by nature has no morality. It's not supposed to. If you want it to work, mm-hmm. it needs to be amoral. It needs to be, right. you know, hypothesis, test, result, and that's it. You don't want morality. You don't want uh, science to be based on morality because then it's not going to work. But you do need to have the people using science to have some kind of moral code <laughs> because then you get then it becomes again can we oh can we can we resurrect dinosaurs let's yeah. try yeah can we make humans that can jump 100 feet in the air let's try can we and then it gets weird man well and it, a lot of times it starts out with good intention and then it turns sour because of the technology that exists uh, because of it right and I, I guess even with the the cloud seeding thing like it's it's happening all over the world now they're trying to uh like one way they do it is with uh planes too where they put like these flares on the planes uh to to create this kind of like these particles to for all the, like the, the moisture to kind of collect too and then that creates the rain to yeah. fall china did it well it's it's china did china it they, yeah right but they they were like trying to weaponize it no oh, okay so here we go yeah uh, who do you think has the greatest interest in controlling the weather yeah. Right. Militaries. Yeah. yeah. So NASA. For, here's a here's a conspiracy for you. NASA was a way for the U.S. government to uh, create a new military arm, but to make it look like it was just oh, a well, space exploration. But in reality, their research is used to you know for for our military. Right. So when you see guys, like, oh no, we were trying to figure out how to fix the climate and do this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's why NASA's hella top secret. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've trained clients. They're like, can't yeah. say. I'm like, you're NASA. Why can't you talk to me about that? Oh, okay. No. Space Force. Yeah. <laughs> Space Force. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Anyway, so, crazy. Yeah. Uh, so here's a, a, another cool article I was reading the other day. They have for the first time ever created um, artificial. Neurons. What? Yes, they've created artificial neurons. So I'm going to read you a little excerpt from this article. So these ner- these artificial neurons are on silicon chips that behave just like the real thing. So this is the first the first ever. They've never been able to do this before, and so this could potentially in the future be used to uh, solve problems, uh, chronic diseases like heart failure, like neurological Alzheimer's, uh, other diseases of neurological degeneration. For example, in heart failure. The neurons at the base of the brain don't respond properly to nervous system feedback, hmm. so then they don't send the right signals to the heart, so it doesn't pump as hard or whatever as it should, but creating these artificial neurons to correct that problem wow, could totally fix it. Wow, wow. Or let's say you get a spinal injury or you have and an injury. And the body accepts it? Like, have they, like, proven that with animals? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. I think that they've just created the artificial neuron, but no, that's like the next- it, Like it imitates it. Yeah, that's the next step, though. Yeah. Which is, this is phenomenal. You know what I mean? We could totally- I mean, that is, yeah, that's totally breakthrough. Yeah, it's like, that's, that's like Star Wars technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You Dude, cut my hand off, no big deal. cyborgs, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, point. what was the, th- you, were, you were showing Sal this morning, I wasn't paying attention, but you were showing him something about Peloton, and you were saying yeah. there was controversy around this. You know, it's interesting about that, like, Courtney actually was was turning me on to it, and, and was like, I'm like, well, what's the, what's the problem with it? Like, show me- show me the commercial. And so she kind of played the commercial for me. And then I'm like, okay. And what are people saying about it? Like what, it was like the most straightforward, like, Hey, like I'm going to like better myself for a year. And, and like my husband bought me this uh, Peloton and I'm going through this and she's like documenting herself going through the process of it. They're watching it on TV, which is kind of weird. Like who does that? You know, anyway, yeah. but they're sitting there and like, and then and she's like, thanks. Like this, this really helped to change me or something like that. And it was like a pretty straightforward message, but then you see all this negative backlash of like, this is so sexist and all this. Cause the, the husband, like the husband got this for her, got to, get her, this for her to get her in shape. She's she even really changed. She was skinny already. Like yeah. why is she even doing this? This is fat shaming people yeah. or she's got an, you know, uh, it was creepy, like a black mirror episode where she'd been forced to do this. And again, you know, <laughs> that, 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 they were just like reading into something that was not even there. You know what I think, dude? Yeah. You want know, to know what I think? Huh. I think Peloton's people went out and created this false uh, this false like outrage. forums with outrage. Yes, oh, because brilliant. now look. Well, like Gillette, so like Gillette did. <clears throat> I think now I don't remember what. Yeah, but they went like completely offensive. No, 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 no. What I mean is, I think Peloton no. made a real commercial that nobody would have a problem yes. with. Then they put out fake people saying, "Oh my God, this is sexist." Yeah. Whatever. Super easy to stir that up. Now everybody's sharing. Everybody's watching the commercial. Yeah, just and the like commercial, a Russian bot. And like the commercial's not a, not a stirring problem. Stirring it up. This is a very uh, effective technique. What's his name wrote about it? Ryan Holiday. 
That's what about right. doing that? That's we create right. false out fake outrage about you, you or yourself. Then it brings people to you. And then they look at it and say, "Yeah, this is actually pretty good." So annoying because it just bring, it just brings out the, <laughs> the, the ridiculous people, dude. Like the, because oh, there man. there is a ridiculous amount of people that jump on board with that. It's so funny. I wonder how many of them are actually being told or paid to do that, and then how many people are actually going like, "Yeah." Yeah, uh, I agree. Uh, like, you could get people outraged for anything. Easy. I sw- I could do it for any. Pick something, and I'll come up with a reason. To I, it. Saw, I, <laughs> I saw I I saw fake it. rallies that start, and then they all get there, and they're just like, "Who's the person in charge? Nobody's in charge. Yeah. They're fucking with you." <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Our first question is from Jake Parker, Health and Wellness. What are the benefits of very low rep ranges on major lifts like bench, squat, and deadlift? Oh man. Yeah, you know, for for a lot of people who work out, they less so now, but for a long time, people avoided. Uh, that was me, dude. The really low rep ranges. Mm-hmm. That was me yeah. forever, for yeah. uh, most of my career. Yeah, most. Be- and the funny thing is that they're really. It's not funny. This is the truth. They're missing out on a lot of the gains that you can get from training in the low rep ranges. Low rep ranges build muscle, just like moderate or higher rep ranges. They all build muscle. They really build muscle and are effective when you're when they're new, when it's a new stimulus. That's why I think it's one of the. I mean, again, I've shared this on the show many times that part of the mo- one of the most compelling things uh, when I first met Sal and and read Maps Anabolic was that he chose to start people in that phase uh, mm-hmm. uh, in phase one of Maps Anabolic. And the brilliance that I thought was in that was that I, I at that time in my my career, it, I was just coming to realize this of training so many people going like, you know what, how many people are just like me where they've been told that the best rep range to build muscle is 8 to 12. If you want to burn fat, you want to do 15, 20 superset circuit type stuff. Very few people that want to change their physique, right, to look better or lose body fat were being told lift five times yeah. that was only the power lifter guys like if you want to be if all you cared about being was strong so maybe if you were a football player or you cared about your bench press and squat you did those type of repetitions right. otherwise the message to the majority was if you want to lose fat or you want to build muscle these are the best rep ranges for that stay in them right and, and two it, it was very intimidating you know, for a lot of people to to jump into that, you know, style because uh, you really had to know what you're doing. Like you had to know the mechanics. Like you you have, you have to go through a, you know, like th- the process of learning those exercises to where you know you're not going to have that little bit of discrepancy that could, you know, like get, lead you to ener- uh, energy injury. <laughs> yeah, I'm all tripping. I'm all I worse. don't. I I actually think that. Uh, I think there is a, a portion of people like that, but I think that a majority were probably even like were more like me, where I wasn't afraid. You just thought it was worthless. Or, yeah, or not that valuable. Yeah, yeah, I just didn't think it was that valuable. I didn't. I the the risk versus reward to me wasn't there. It was, yeah, if I go really really heavy, I could potentially hurt myself, and I'm probably it's not the best place to build muscle. It's not the best place to build body fat or burn body fat. So it's not for me. I don't identify with it as a power lifter, so I neglected it. For many many years, and and when you find, remember when you finally really oh, started to God, implement bro. it. I mean, I I really attribute that the, you know strength training and and in that rep range to the the way my physique looked like at the amateur level to the professional level to me is the was really that that mm-hmm. big. I mean, it really packed on more muscle on my body than I had in the last fifteen years consistently lifting, mm-hmm. uh, and it was something that I missed out. Now. That comes with some risk, like to Justin's point. Like, I mean, I do notice that my joints were more achy, and I did notice those things. That, but I also know that I fell into the same pattern that I I coach and talk to clients about: is don't get stuck in something because it starts to show you the results. And yeah. what happened? I introduced you know strength training uh, more than I'd ever done in my life. I saw the benefits. I became addicted to the benefits, so I kept training in that range. And then here comes the achy hips, totally. the achy joints. And well, I mean, besides that too, like I think like the actual benefit too. A lot of people that don't do it, like like don't know like your your capacity. You can increase your capacity. To produce more force, yep. and and that's a that's a big part of strength, and, and to have you know more strength at your fingertips when when you want it, like right away, is such an advantage than going into any other modality. Right, it carries so much into the, that, and that is the thing that I think I, I I missed big time was realizing, oh shit, like even if I don't want to be a powerlifter and I don't want to strength train all the time, just at least running a block. 
or a phase of that, how much that contributed over into my hypertrophy training. Oh yeah, being yep. able to summon your strength uh, in, in, for a, a heavy load is a skill. Um, and it's a very important skill that has carry over to all the other physical skills, or especially all the skills related to strength. Now you have to do it appropriately, just like any other rep range or any other training modality. It's got to be done appropriately. So one thing that we always and, I, and this I learned this later on. So when I was younger, my low rep tr rep training was in, improper. It was maxing out. That's that's improper. Yeah, like every time. Yeah, low rep. This is actually a big misconception. People think training in low rep ranges means maxing out. That's actually not training. That's mm -hmm. maxing out. That's that's something totally separate. Low rep training done appropriately is practicing lifting heavy loads for low reps, but you're not maxing out. So what I mean by that is, let's say I'm doing sets of squats for three reps. That's a, The weight that I pick is a weight that I can max out for six reps or five reps. That's the proper way to do three reps with a heavy weight. I'm not doing three reps with a, with a weight that I can only do three reps with. Right. I'm not maxing you, you out. You almost fail on three. That's a terrible way to do it. And I learned this later on. I remember reading about the old-time strongmen and old-time bodybuilders and how they trained. And then I, it led me to a book called Dinosaur Training, which I've actually referred to uh, before on the podcast. Yep. Um, and there's some interesting, uh, there's some valuable information in that book. And what the guy writes about is practicing your lifts. You go out there, you pick up a heavy weight that you could probably do three or four reps with, but you just pick it up once. It's still heavy. You still got to get used to lifting something heavy. You still have to summon a lot of strength. Well, that in that to that point right there is something else with it, to this question. What, why do it and what is it contributing to that, again, that I was neglecting is the central nervous system. That was a piece, when, yes. and, and I love, and we've talked on the show so many times about your analogy of it as the amplifier to your muscles or your speakers. And I was putting so much investment in my speakers and having great speakers, bigger speakers, better looking speakers, but I was putting very little energy into improving the amplifier that actually puts out all that and it, all that energy into the speakers. And so think of it like that when you're training that those singles like you're talking about or those low rep ranges is you're investing in getting a better amplifier, a better CNS that is going to then contribute to all the other yes, pursuits. And it also makes you it, practicing training in this way appropriately makes it makes you more comfortable handling heavy weight and it makes you more comfortable exerting yourself at that level. Now, I would experience this oftentimes with clients. More often than not, it was my female clients where they were afraid to exert the effort that re that was required to lift heavy weights. Now, again, mm -hmm. I'm not maxing them out, but they just were afraid of pushing themselves that way because they just had never been used to it. Once we would train in these low rep ranges, they felt more confident and functional with their strength because they understand how to control it. They understand what they're capable of. So there's a lot of value in training in very low rep ranges, and all of this contributes to a better physique. Now, if you get stuck in this phase, just like if you get stuck in any other phase of training, your body will stop responding. Um, but if you never train in low rep ranges, try doing it for you know three to five weeks. Just watch what happens. Here's my prediction. If you've never done it before, over the next three to five weeks, you'll get significantly stronger every single week. Yeah. Every single week, you'll get stronger in some of these core lifts. What do you think that's going to do to the way your body looks. It's obviously going to be reflected in, in your aesthetics. Next question is from Mo Daywood. How does sleep affect fat loss? Can inadequate sleep hinder fat loss even if macros are correct? Fuck yeah, cortisol. Definitely, yeah. So so um, so here's the main ways that lack of sleep affects fat loss. The main way it affects uh, fat loss is it changes your eating patterns and behaviors and your activity levels, okay? Because you're obviously tired. Uh, your body perceives it as stress. So, you know, the way we evolved was if you didn't have good sleep, your body's perceiving that as you need to be alert and awake. Like, why would you in nature be up, you know, most of the night or not sleeping? Probably because you're not in a safe environment. So your body's perceiving as stress. Now, a stressed out body wants to, A, store more body fat because that's an insurance. More often than not, the stress that we were under was either predators or lack of food. So I want more. So what it's going to do, it's going to make you eat more food as a result. So they've done this in studies and shown that people's appetites tend to increase. It also tends to make you crave foods that give you more Sugary of a foods. Yeah, psychological well-being, like feeling of, of well-being, like this temporary feel-good effect. And this is anytime you feel like shit. Um, the second thing is your body will lose muscle. Uh, in a stressed out uh, situation, your muscle starts to deteriorate because 
muscle's expensive. It's expensive tissue. Um, and your body's trying to become it's a luxury. more efficient. Yeah. Um, so lack of activity or, or altered activity patterns, more food intake or worse food intake, that's the main way it makes you gain body fat. But the second part of the question was, what if the macros are good? Can it still hinder fat loss? Yes, um, I definitely think so. I think there's this there, – your body can lose weight and gain weight in different ways. It's not always going to be body fat. So what may end up happening is you may end up weighing the same, but you're less muscle and more body fat. So overall, weight stays the same, but your your body composition. Is what about changed. how 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 cortisol is affected and your thyroid and things like that? That can be affected. That's what that's that's what I'm referring to. So let's say your calories are the same, but your cortisol is totally impacted. The way you store body fat is going to change, and the, and you may store more body fat and lose muscle. Um, I mean, calories in versus calories out starts to still obey, but you know. And here's the other part, Adam. You're absolutely right. Can hormonal changes alter how many calories your body burns at rest? Yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. You give a man testosterone, uh, don't change his activity levels, and he'll just naturally get a little leaner and build more muscle right. just from the changes in hormones. So I've noticed, I tell you what, um, if my sleep isn't this is, good- this is, this is an example of where I, I get frustrated with the, the, the academics. So, you know, when we talked about with the science, when you talk about yeah. calories in versus calories out, and then they try and bash like, oh, oh, they talk about make insulin a demon. They make cortisol sound like a demon. Those things are all good. Well, no, it's not a demon. It's all part of the body. But absolutely, you affect sleep. That changes your hormone profile. Your hormone profile now changes your metabolism, which the rule, the law of thermodynamics still applies, right. but it's now changed for you. It's exactly. now different. You're no, your calorie maintenance, which let's say, you know, for hypothetical reasons and for this argument's sake, your calorie maintenance was 2,500. That's what your body burns at rest all day long. And then all of a sudden you have two, three days in a row of poor sleep. Your calorie maintenance is no longer 2,500. Your body is perceiving it as under stress. It slows down to conserve energy and save body and, and to produce or save body uh, fat for energy. And so then your calorie maintenance now becomes 2,200 or 2,000. And so law of thermodynamics still applies. And yeah, if your macros, but your macros are going to have to have been changed. It can't stay the same as what it was when you were getting great sleep because now you're... you're it's, a, it's a good point because I think a lot of times people, they, they assume that the that your calorie burn, aside from activity, because I don't they don't assume it for activity, but if everything stays the same, uh, but you change your stress, well, your calorie burn is a fixed number. No, it's not. A lot of stuff affects... Your, cal- it's your calorie very burn. your this whole idea that we're we are stuck with a metabolism is hilarious. Yeah, yeah. your metabolism like can point. can shift daily. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You don't you and you, you find your calorie maintenance out one day. I mean, in four weeks, it could be completely different. If you add a couple pounds of muscle and lose body fat, you reduce stress. You could you could see a huge yeah. difference. And we, the, used, the, we used to measure that with the the body gym. Was that called? Yeah, Where you yeah. breathe into it. And I remember like being excited about that device because I was like, wow, you can actually find out like where they're at with their metabolism currently right now. And then, you know, you do it the next day, you do it the next week, you're getting completely different numbers based off of their stress. Yeah. I've had this happen now several, I had this happen to me several times with clients where I would have a, I'll give you an example of one client in particular. She was type A, go, 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 like just the classic overdo everything type of person. So once she, and this was early on in my career. So this actually learned, initially learned this through training her. So I was all about calories in versus calories out, how much you're burning, whatever. I'd have her track her food. She'd show me her calories. Oh, you want to get leaner? We're just going to increase your activity level. And I would push that for a while. And we got stuck. We got stuck for a little while. And I remember thinking to myself like, okay, if I'm going to push her any harder, I got to give her some time to rest and record. So my idea wasn't to, it would make her leaner. I thought, I needed her to, to, to get some rest so we could go after it again later on. So I'm going to say, okay, for the next couple months, here's what I want you to do. Rather than running, uh, you know, on I forgot what days it were, but let's just for argument's sake, rather than running on Saturday and Wednesday, like you always do, where you do all your intervals and your long distance runs, what I want you to do is I want you to go take a relaxing meditation class and I want you to really focus on your sleep. And so she was like, well, what about my calories and what about I'm not going to burn as much calories and I said look I know we're not burning as many calories I said don't worry about it we'll make up for it later on once I feel like your body's more recovered well here's the crazy part she did that not only did she not gain weight she lost weight she started to get leaner I, and, remember, I remember seeing the exact same thing and it blew me away I was yeah. like how's this possible this must, she must be lying to me she's counting and then I started to put a piece of together like oh her body's working better 
Right. She's just healthier. And yeah. so, and that would happen. That's happened and over a dozen I, times. I had this conversation last night uh, with um, my, my mom's husband right now. We were talking about stress and I was trying to explain to him uh, that, you know, your, your body uh, doesn't know the difference between a, a horn being honked, you lifting weights in the gym, the argument you had with your wife when you got home from work, your boss screaming at you. It, it's all stress. Mm -hmm. It's all stress. And if you're getting it from all ends, all going to the gym and hammering your body, even even though you and this is what was hard to communicate to him because he's like, I feel good. Yes, he goes. <laughs> he goes. Yeah, no, that's I love to go work out, and I had and I was like exactly, and that's the worst thing you could do in that state. I said, in fact, you get in a big argument with my mom, or you have something, you get in a fight at work with somebody like that, and you don't want to go hammer the weights out. If you're going to go to the weights, it should be more recuperative, or maybe that's the day you decide to meditate or spend time walking, and then the day that you feel rested, no stress, everything else. That's the day you get yeah. after it. The, the reason why it's hard to understand for people is because it does feel good right. because mm -hmm. cortisol feels good. Here's yeah. the thing that, that people need to understand. We hear all the time about elevated cortisol and too much of it's not good or whatever. Um, and by the way, cortisol has very uh, fundamental roles in the human body. You don't want to slam cortisol down because that'll yeah. not make you healthy either. But here's the deal with cortisol. It feels good. Yeah. If I gave you injections of cortisol, you'd have energy, you'd be hyped, you'd be it's your stress hormone. It's supposed to do that. So when you're super stressed, I live off that in the morning. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? That's so, what gets me out of bed. So if you're feeling shitty or whatever and you go to the gym and beat the crap out of yourself, you give yourself another spike of cortisol, all of a sudden you feel better. Well, now nah, because you're you're becoming a cortisol junkie, but eventually, like we can become insulin resistant. Our bodies stop utilizing cortisol very effectively. We need more and more of it, then we start to develop problems. Next question is from Jeremiah Johnson. Besides calves, what is your favorite body part to develop, and how do you go about training it? <laughs> they must be talking to you guys. Yeah, it's slight, <laughs> slight jab yeah, there. Yeah, hey. know. You know, some of my favorite body parts to train um, are my favorites because they were, when I was younger, they were areas that were difficult mm. uh, to develop. <laughs> So like when I first started working out, um, there were a few things that I was very, I was obviously body image issues. I would talk about this often on the podcast. It's what motivated me. There were a particular parts of my body that I was really, you know, concerned with. One of them was my shoulders. I'm not a wide person structurally. I don't have a wide bone structure. Um, so I had no muscle, plus I was narrow to begin with. And I didn't like the way I looked in t-shirts. I felt like I looked like, like a coat hanger. So I made a special emphasis on training my shoulders. Now I did a good job with my technique and my my program or whatever. My shoulders ended up becoming a, a strong suit. Until this day, I really love the feeling of training my shoulders. I love the way they look when they're pumped. It's a fun body part uh, to train. Same thing for my back. I had the mm -hmm. same problem on my back. It was skinny. I wasn't wide. Um, and I remember just I remember like it was yesterday the first time I got a lat pump, and it was when I had been working out my back for a little while. Couldn't feel my back working. I think a lot of people have this issue when they first start working out. It's like, I just feel it in my biceps. I'm like, am I really working my back? Yeah. And I read this article on supersets, and I did a pre-exhaust superset where I did dumbbell pullovers, which is more of an isolation movement, and I went straight to pull-ups. And I remember getting down off those pull-ups and standing there and being like, what? Mm -hmm. I have a pump in my – that feels weird. Oh, my – I was so excited about it, and, and I love those two parts. Yeah. Still my favorites. I'm your, I'm your prototypical, like, Monday chest day guy. <laughs> yeah, like I am that guy. Like I, I've always loved, uh, you know, building and developing the chest, and uh, it was just something that, again, this is kind of playing into your strengths, and um, it was one of those things I found that that I could compete with somebody that was like a good 50, 60 pounds heavier than me. You know, like I could I could hang with with people in that lift specifically, and then also, uh, you know, with my triceps as well. So it's kind of that combo of the chest triceps, where you know I was like it, dips or bench press. If, if I couldn't think of anything in the gym, it's like I'm doing one or the other because <laughs> at, for some it just gave me this good feeling. I just felt strong and capable. And, uh, uh, you know, it didn't hurt that I, I beat the record for, like, dips at, at my school at the time. So I was, like, was it for reinforcing number? it. Was it for no total dips or weight strapped with a dip? No, it was total dips. What was, yeah, the, to was, what was number, the number? Yeah. 900 and something? No, I don't I don't even remember, to be honest. Typical 12? Justin. He's 12. so yeah. he's so humble. I know. Yeah. He's like, I like, would know that number. Like, a, <laughs> like 137. I don't remember. It's no in the deal. past, Bro, dude. Adam and I, Adam would have a tattoo of it. Yeah. I would know it. <laughs> For sure. I mean, like, it was oh, definitely over 100. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Oh, yeah. shit. Uh, you know what's actually funny about this question is that 
when I, as a kid, uh, 100% it was arms. Cause I think for the first three years of lifting weights, all I did was arms. Um, and then after that, I, I actually have fall. I've always still to this day fallen in love with training the body part that is the, the weakest or most underdeveloped. Yeah. And what a great mental strategy. I know. Yeah, right. Like, like, I've learned to do that. But yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and the, it being completely transparent on is probably my least favorite of those, of those. Cause there's a lot, there was lots of underdeveloped parts is calves and forearms because they're probably the least contributors to almost everything else going on with the body. Like it's like, if you yeah, if you got strong arms, having you know weaker forearms, whatever you know, what I'm saying it's like they they're responsible for very little. Your calves, meh. if my legs are fucking jacked and cool, my kid, whatever they're not. so. I think that those ones have always probably I would say those are my least two favorite to to work and develop on because I think they're just as far as contributing to your overall strength, your overall physique. I feel like they play the the least amount of role. Plus, I think they have the the greatest difference genetic wise. You either have great big forearms, or you have great calves. Not that you can't develop those two, because I have done that in both areas. It's just less fun in comparison to everyone else. Everything else, like I've loved go. I love going to the gym. I mean, currently right now, like it's it's quad and squats for me. Like I'm all into that. Where I'm in powerlifting, it makes sense to be kind of in that in that focus, and so. I'm really enjoying developing my legs right now. And I've been here before where that's a focus. Uh, I can attest to Sal's shoulders. I remember I've shared the story uh, when one of my female uh, trainer clients that used to compete uh, told me that my I asked her to assess my physique because she was a competitor and she said I had weak shoulders and I remember that would like hurt my feelings. And I, <laughs> you know, that became and that actually kind of started. Uh, Somebody that, said no delts to me the other yeah, day. Yeah, she, like, cool. Yeah, so, <laughs> said that said that to Thanks me, for that. and that set me down the path of developing shoulders. And my shoulders became one of my strengths, and that probably is what lit the fire of like looking at my physique and going like, oh, my chest is weak. Oh, my back is weak. Oh, my quads are weak. Oh, my hamstrings are weak. And then programming to address that. And what what's needed when you when you understand when you've been lifting for a really long time that chasing after the areas that you're weak in gives you that sense almost that like that novelty thing again where your body is going to respond best if i go and let's say my biceps for example is a, a major strength of mine because of all the the work i did early on and still continued that for many years it's kind of boring to train them uh, because th I'm not going to squeeze very much out of them, even uh, at when my arms are at their biggest. I can get back to my biggest arms ever with very little effort because I've already put all it's the work. It's just not challenging. It's not challenging. Yeah. It's easy. I'm but, like that with quads. Right, right. So if you if it's an area that it's easy for me to develop, I'm less interested in. I'm more interested in the areas where like, oh, man, if I put some work in, I could see a difference and change. So at, at one point, they've all, uh, I mean, shoulders at one time was that. I mean, back when I was doing the deadlift thing with Sal and I was competing because your back is like for sure one of the biggest difference makers in men's physique, uh, having an impressive back. So I, I got a kick out of developing that, my and my shoulders, my arms, uh, my chest for sure. There was a point where uh, I had an, an uneven chest. My, my left pec was significantly larger than my right. And so addressing the imbalances there, then catching it up and then getting actually a really good strong bench and a, and a, a pretty good chest. Uh, I, I've, I've enjoyed all of it. I, I really reframe, reframe uh, how I look at my physique as when I look at weak points and go, oh, cool, I have something that I can improve upon and program around and I will see a difference if I follow and execute. And I, I try and give this tip to a lot of clients when they're focusing in the gym is, you know, if you're, if you, especially if you're aesthetic driven, you know, pick something that is a, a weak area and that you go see the most improvement there than anywhere else. Fall in love with training it and you're going to train it. You're yeah. not going to skip it. Right. That's a great mental strategy. Next question is from Freeman Axtell. How do you each vote with your dollars? Oh, great. What oh, that, a, is, that is a cool question. What huh. a good question because I think people forget how much power we have in uh, free societies to change and mold um, basically uh, the things around us in society. Um, so many things are driven by the market, obviously, and the market responds to our money and our dollars. And if we give our money to something because we like it, more of that thing will be produced. And if something gets no money, uh, then less of it will be produced. And so we, we this is a great question because I, per, people forget, they think that we're we're powerless, but it's like every day you make so many choices and decisions 
that that really make an impact and we can change the the, the tide of things. I love this too because I can't wait to hear your answer because I feel like you don't vote on anything. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> or or very little. Yeah. Well, so here's what I so I've, I've thought a lot about this. <laughs> I remember when I first um, understood this concept uh, as a kid. I thought to myself, like, I'm going to give money to the companies that are, you know, that have the best ideals and morals and and that kind of stuff. No, that's not how I think. And then I got and then as I got older, I started to realize that uh, what I need to do. Is is and this is what we kind of do this naturally a little bit with more self awareness. I think we could be more effective though. Buy the the stuff that is best. Just that's it. Like you want a car, buy the best car according to your values, and be aware of that. If you want to buy, uh, you know, if you want to buy food, buy the food that you value the most. But be a little bit self aware, right? So like, okay, I value this for yeah. its nutrition. I value it for its. Like if I if I talk a lot about like grass fed meat for example, I want to make sure I go and buy it so that there's more signals to that market to produce more organic for example. Organic for sure. Organic uh, was a lot more expensive ten years ago. Shit, fifteen years ago, you couldn't find organic. It still oil. is, but that's a good example of why I still vote by putting my money there. Is yes, I know I could save on the chicken breasts that are non organic by two dollars every single time, yeah. which ends up adding up. But I'm spending that extra money because I want to see that industry grow. Yep, yep. Well, and that was a thing too. I mean, like with farmers markets, and then being able to like do these. Uh, I forget what you call them, but like I get like a, a whole basket of, of vegetables and, and things that are locally grown. And so, you know, my mentality had shifted over the years of like how how much can I kind of give back to my local community? And so I'll, I'll go down to uh, like uh, down to, to Felton and I'll go down to Santa Cruz and I'm constantly trying to to use my dollar to kind of benefit the local businesses in the area as well. Yeah. I, you know, and again, I think what we want, what we really want in society is we an want, American truck. We want the, <laughs> we want the America. best people uh, producing our products. What I mean by that is we want the people who can produce them with the best quality for the cheapest price. Now, why is that important? Why is cheap price important? Because price is a signal that shows us efficiency. And and, and, and money represents resources. And the reason why free markets uh, pr produce so much wealth and why we have so much food and so much shelter and why we've solved a lot of problems is because the way that we allocate resources is determined by price. If something is expensive, what that means is that, there, that there's a low supply of that particular thing and the demand might not be, and the demand may be high. So as this, the, the demand is high, more supply goes to that and the price starts to drop. And so I want the best people doing those things. So I, when I, sometimes, I think sometimes we get caught up on what people say. So like you have a CEO who's like, I, you know, this is what I stand for. And, and people are like, oh, I don't, I don't want to buy this product. Totally fine. Totally up to you to, to you to make that decision. But for me, I don't, really, I don't care so much about what they say. I care a lot more about what they do and make. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, the way I judge a company is by their products, more so than- Their personal values. Yeah, like yeah. I'll look at their products and be like, this person is making the best you know, shoes. These shoes are amazing. They're great. They're, they're cheap. They're, they're, if, if they last a long time. So I, I think they should get them, even though this person may sound like an asshole. I don't care because they're making the best thing. That's what's going to benefit us. It's you know I I one hundred percent agree, and I I yeah. I find it funny when I hear people that like you know talk shit about Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates yes. or you know Steve Jobs, and they have and then I look at them like you fucking asshole you're using all their products. Yeah, you're using all their <laughs> products, and you talk shit about the person. Like yeah. either one, like it, that shouldn't matter to you because you support them because they're 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 creating superior products for you. Or two, if you really don't like them that much, then you shouldn't buy his fucking products, right? So yeah. I think it's really funny when people do that. And I, It's hypocritical. I, I, this is also how I've always justified the, some of the things that uh, other people might think that I spend excessively on. Like, uh, I have an expensive TV. I drive an expensive car. I have an expensive bed. But these are areas that I value a ton on innovation. I love the f where we are with television today versus where I was with a kid. Yeah. Fucking A. You can hang it. It looks like a. it's as light as a picture frame now. It, it fits on your wall. It's clear. Yeah, as mine is a picture frame You now, feel like cool. you're watching yeah. the people in person. It is, and I'm a movie guy. Do you remember guy. how heavy TV, people, you're <laughs> listening, if you're like under the age of 35, you have no idea 
how heavy <laughs> TVs used to the be. The tube. Dude. Yes. Oh. You know what? Your friend trying to get you to move it down three flights of no. stairs. No. So I oh. gave, we had a 30, the, the the last, you know, heavy TV like that I had. Uh, you know, and dude, I, I bought three. one off you. We, <laughs> yeah. No, even before that, the okay. heavy, heavy yeah. tube ones. That back then, the biggest you could get was a 36, a 36 tube TV it's was fucking like 300 big, pounds, dude. Way more than that. And awkward and yeah, big. We actually, people. we lived and we lived on the third floor. We gave it away, whoever would pick it up. So that yeah. was the deal. We were moving and I was like, man, I could try to sell this for a few hundred bucks. Fuck that. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to take it to anybody. So the deal was if you came and got it out of the house, you could have the fucking thing because it weighed so it's much. It's like sword in the stone. But these, these are things that, um, you know, and I, and I think of uh, as a kid, I grew up in a hand-me-down bed and had terrible sleep and you know, I remember when I first started making a little bit of money and invested in my first like $5,000 mattress, which was a huge deal to me. Holy shit, it changed my life. It changed the way I slept. And so innovation in that area, if we can continue to make better beds that are better and yeah. more support and give me better sleep, I am all for spending money there. Same yeah. thing with the TV. Yeah. Same thing for the way I am about my car. And like, here's the best thing. Here's the best thing. Because we could definitely try to be self-aware and, okay, where am I spending my money and all that stuff? And that's important. But really, at the end of the day, if people are healthy, and I mean that in the full sense, the whole sense, we're healthy physically, mentally, spiritually, we have a sense of meaning, then the choices that we're going to make are going to be the best. They're going to be the best choices. We're going to see less of the stuff that we tend to see that we get mad at, like, you know, why are the why are these social media stars so popular? Why are they making, why, are there, why is there a liquor store on every corner or whatever? If people are healthy, if we just take care of ourselves in the truest sense, the choices that we're going to make are going to reflect that. The money is going to go to the things that are going to benefit humanity the most, and it's going to cause the greatest change uh, in the most positive way. So really, be a healthy person, and then your choices will reflect that, and you'll vote in the best way with your dollars, in my opinion. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our resources. We have a lot of free guides and books on there you can go download. Also, Check us all out on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin. You can find me at Mind Pump Sal and Adam at Mind Pump Adam.